The uh, Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations and Related Programs will come to order. I want to start by welcoming all the subcommittee members to our first hearing on the fiscal year 2013 budget request. Mrs. Lowy and I share a commitment to oversight and we will continue to work with each of you to get the right information to make fair, although sometimes difficult, funding decisions on programs in our subcommittee's jurisdiction. Madam Secretary, I want to welcome you to today's hearing. You're serving as Secretary during an amazingly challenging time. And as you've said, American leadership is more important than ever. Two weeks ago, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff came before our Defense Subcommittee. General Dempsey told us that, in his judgment, formed over 38 years of military service, we're living in the most dangerous time in his life. I have to agree with General Dempsey, and it seems as if every corner of the world faces significant challenges, both economic and political, and the United States is not immune. With our country facing record deficits and debts, this committee has a special responsibility to ensure that taxpayers' dollars are used and well spent. Our constituents demand that our foreign aid is aligned with our national security interests and, and American values, and for that reason, the fiscal year 2012 Appropriations Bill contained conditions on funding to many countries so that we would have time to see how events on the ground unfold before funds are dispersed. The Congress provided the administration flexibility because we believed it was the most responsible approach to take in a constantly changing environment. Madam Secretary, you now have the responsibility to ensure that this committee is properly consulted, certifications are made when required, and notifications are sent before funds are obligated. We know these conditions create challenges, but oversight by the Congress, of course, is critical. We're faced with several policy issues that are especially troubling. They include the current unrest in Afghanistan, causing all of us to question the security of our troops and our civilians who are working there. The ongoing crisis in Egypt over nonprofit groups working there to promote democracy, Iran's continued pursuit of the nuclear weapons and the resulting threat to our friends and allies in the region, the possibility of the Palestinians going around direct negotiations with Israel and the intensifying conflict with Syria, just to name a few. During the hearing today, I hope you'll address these issues and explain how the administration's requested increase for programs in this subcommittee's jurisdiction will deal with these issues successfully, especially when the defense budget is proposed to be reduced. The $54.7 billion request for the State Foreign Operations Subcommittee is an increase of 2.6 percent above fiscal year 2012, and the majority of that increase is for state and USAID's programs. Part of this increase is for a new account, the Middle East and North Africa Incentive Fund. The subcommittee needs to understand why the budget uh, pr proposes such a significant increase, roughly $700 million, without a clear plan of how the funds will help these new and emergency democracies. We also need more information on why the budget proposes a decrease in assistance to Latin America, Asia, and Africa, regions we can't afford to overlook or certainly take for granted. The President himself was in Latin America last uh, year and said that the region is more important to the prosperity and security of the United States than ever before. He also visited the Asia-Pacific area in the fall and said it was a region of huge strategic importance. We've also heard about military officials wanting to position special operations forces in Latin America, Asia, and Africa because of growing threats. Madam Secretary, we will need more information to understand how the State Department's budget proposal is consistent with these statements by administration officials. The budget request also proposes to reduce global health programs. As we work with you and USAID Administrator Shaw, who we'll hear from next week, we'll need to understand how these reductions can be achieved without jeopardizing our uh, process and our leadership in these issues. As you look ahead to the coming year, I'd like to offer a few comments on some priorities that I hope you'll focus on. I think that many, if not uh, most, of uh, these concerns are shared by all the subcommittee colleagues. First, I hope the administration 
will continue to focus on efforts in the frontline states so that you can solidify the military's accomplishments in Iraq, identify sustainable solutions once our troops leave Afghanistan, and ensure that extremists no longer have safe havens in Pakistan. There's so much at stake in these countries. Next, I hope you'll remain vigilant in your support of our neighbors and friends to the South. Latin America's enormous security challenges affect the United States every day, and of course you know that. On the diplomatic front, I hope you and other administration officials will continue to keep pressure on Iran wherever and whenever possible to stop them from obtaining nuclear weapons. Finally, I want to reiterate a topic we discussed last year during the subcommittee hearing multi-year funding commitments. I continue to be concerned about the effect of these out-year pledges on the state foreign operations budget. While I support many of the same causes, the United States remains in an economic crisis and will be, and we will be a very difficult, uh, in a very difficult position if we can't live up to those promises. I hope you'll seriously consider any additional commitments and follow the consultation and notification requirements we've included in, in the appropriations bill. Your job as secretary is certainly not without challenges. We truly thank you, and we thank your dedicated uh, staff and men and women of the State Department and USAID for what they do every day to promote American interests abroad. I want to say a special thank you to Ambassador Ann Patterson her team in Cairo, and numerous staff in Washington uh, who are dealing with a very complex situation in Egypt. They've been in constant contact, and we all look forward uh, to a resolution. We look forward to your testimony, and now I'll turn to my very good friend and ranking member, Mrs. Lowy. Hi, thank you, Madam Secretary. I let me a little housekeeping. I'll be calling on members based on seniority, uh, alternating between majority and, and minority. Uh, because this is a very active subcommittee <laughs> and very involved, and I know they all have questions, so we'll keep to the five minutes, uh, and the, you'll have a light uh, after I take my time, of course. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to start by congratulating you. I know you were very careful when you said it was a modest uh, advance with North Korea, but it is very important, and so uh, the, the possibility of having uh, a, a, a moratorium and agreement is very important. Congratulations. I want to ask first about Egypt. We talked a little bit about that and the very difficult situation there that's uh, occurring with our NGOs. Uh, not only the safety of the American citizens are at stake, but of course our partnership with Egypt and also the implications for other U.S. sponsored democracy promotion around the world. So I know you said in your Senate appropriations hearing yesterday that you were not going to answer whether you could certify uh, that Egypt's complying with the conditions of the appropriations bill. But I would ask you, when do you think un and under what conditions can you make that decision? Uh, and what would be the uh, potential impact on the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, please? Well, Madam Chairwoman, first let me thank you for your very uh, kind and strong words uh, about Ann Patterson. She is one of our absolute best. And she and her team in Cairo, working closely with us here in Washington, um, have been managing um, a difficult moment in our relationship with Egypt. Uh, we are uh, pushing forward and hope to see the specific issue about uh, the NGOs resolved um, uh, shortly. We've had a lot of very tough conversations. Um, once we uh, make progress on the NGO issues, then uh, we can have a broader uh, discussion, both with the Congress and uh, with the Egyptian uh, government. Of course, one of our problems is we don't really have an Egyptian government to have a conversation with. And I keep reminding myself of that because it is a uh, an uncertain situation for all the different players. You, know, you can talk to one, but uh, you, you really need to talk to hundreds uh, because we don't yet have a single address for authoritative decision making. And that will not be um, probably available until after their presidential election. So uh, we do have to recognize that what Egypt is going through is a 
an earthquake of uh, great political and strategic importance, obviously to the Egyptian people, but also to the region. Specifically, it is uh, you know, my uh, assessment as of now uh, that uh, there is uh, no uh, threat to the Camp David Accords, to the existing uh, uh, peace agreement with Israel. Um, but that is uh, at the top of our list as we go through these uh, uh, difficult periods of change uh, with the Egyptians. And, you know, we will obviously address um, the funding issues in due course, including uh, the certification requirements and waiver options that the Congress included. We will consult fully with you. Uh, I think we're all on the same side. We want to support Egypt in their democratic transition, but we also want to see uh, a commitment to really implementing democracy, not just one election one time, and then uh, uh, not uh, any kind of recognition of minority and other rights. And we want to see uh, the uh, peace treaty continue to anchor stability so that Egypt can develop uh, uh, in the future. As we're watching that, I, I understand the World Bank and the IMF are considering substantial loan packages. What is the administration, in this, in this time period we're all watching, what is the administration's position on those loans? Um, we um, have encouraged uh, the IMF and World Bank and the Egyptian government to engage in the kind of uh, negotiation that would bring about uh, aid based on conditions. Uh, similar to what you put into the, uh, our own legislation, any IMF agreement would require uh, a lot of reforms that ultimately would be in the best interests of the Egyptian people. Uh, we think one of the real threats to peace and stability uh, in Egypt and in the region is a severe economic downturn. So at this point, we continue to uh, encourage the Egyptians to make the hard decisions that have to be made to uh, be able to get IMF and World Bank assistance. Uh, I'm going to ask the other question about Iran that everyone is concerned about in, in, in lots of um, senses. but. Um, as we go forward, the sanctions on Iran's central bank and that the Congress established seem to be having some impact. It's hard to judge how much of an impact. Um, but I, can you, I know you won't lay out your negotiating uh, tactics, of course not, but we'd like to get a sense of the administration's benchmarks for changes you want to see in Iran. And also, um, what kind of tools that you're using are that we can, as we, we uh, several of us have traveled recently, and the countries surrounding Iran have said, you need to do more, but we're very nonspecific about what more was. Can you address that, please? Well, I think we should recognize what uh, has been accomplished uh, with the sanctions that uh, the Congress uh, uh, passed and that we are aggressively implementing. Um, we have, over three years, built uh, a foundation for uh, international acceptance of this kind of pressure. We always said we'd have a two-track uh, engagement with Iran, pressure and discussion. Uh, discussion hasn't gone anywhere, but pressure has been ratcheted up. And I, I really believe that uh, uh, because of the uh, persistent diplomacy that we have engaged in, uh, we have gotten uh, countries to take actions that they themselves would not have uh, imagined. However, um, we know that more has to be done. We uh, believe uh, from all of our reporting and sourcing that these sanctions are having an impact inside Iran. Uh, we know that there is a debate going on inside Iran among various power centers. Um, we uh, also are committed to implementing these sanctions to continue to ratchet up the pressure, but at the same time, when Iran finally responded to the invitation to resume the P5 plus one uh, negotiations, uh, we encouraged uh, a very close look at uh, what would be required to actually uh, begin those again. So there is, there is nothing clear or easy about uh, this uh, effort to calibrate the pressure and expectations, uh, but I do think sanctions are working. Um, they are producing the kind of pressure we had hoped for. We'll, we'll test the sincerity on the negotiation part. Uh, but as you know, President Obama has said many times, 
Uh, our policy is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, and that means, you know, all options are under consideration. Uh, let me ask you about that. Uh, I understand it was from a, a discussion on a congressional delegation that President Sarkozy um, pressed the administration in a letter to take um, more rigorous sanctions. Uh, that was in November and uh, then went before the EU for, for sanctions. But I couldn't get an answer on what the administration's response was uh, on that request. Well, I think that our actions are the response. Um, you know, since that time, the Central Bank of Iran has been uh, sanctioned. The EU has moved much further than they had in the past. Um, President uh, Sarkozy has, uh, you know, been a great ally uh, to the United States on many issues, and in particular on, on uh, pressuring Iran. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, given the congressional action, given the administration action, and given what we've been able to get our partners to do, um, we have uh, advanced uh, the economic pressures significantly. Now, if you look, for example, at the uh, refusal now by insurers to insure Iranian vessels, uh, they can't even uh, export uh, their goods, uh, including uh, crude oil, because they can't get insurance to do so. So, I mean, we're going at this from all angles. I want to commend our colleagues at Treasury, uh, as well as you know my team at the State Department. We've been creative, <laughs> we've been tenacious, um, and we have faced some challenges because even some of our very best friends um, have to make serious uh, adjustments in order to comply. But we've laid the groundwork so that they understand that, you know, this is an important international commitment and they're stepping up. Speaking of our, our very best friends, uh, I have to ask you about Israel. If Israel were to take the position um, uh, to strike Iran, tell me what you think would be the reaction of um, the rest of the Middle East? Um, you know, look, we are, we are under no illusion uh, about the uh, threat that a nuclear-armed Iran poses uh, to Israel and to the region. Uh, that's why we've, we've so focused on bringing uh, unprecedented pressure to bear on Iran. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, we believe that we um, are making progress on the sanctions front. We have said that publicly. We have said that privately. Um, and there, there is certainly uh, a lot more that we can do and that we're in the process of doing. So uh, from, from our perspective, let's focus on the economic sanctions that we have the world behind right now and uh, uh, see how much pressure we can put. Let's test these negotiations with the P5 plus one. Um, and uh, then take stock of where we are, and, and certainly that's you know that's the uh, uh, core of the discussions that we've had with Israel and with others in the region. I know Mrs. Lowy has uh, many questions. I have this is my last question. It has to do with UNESCO, and your budget request includes funds for UNESCO, uh, and it says that you intend to ask to work with the Congress on providing authority to waive the pr provisions that we have in our bill having to do with the funding for UNESCO. Um, so, I'm saying, if does this mean that you only want a waiver authority if there's a negotiated settlement, or what? What, what is the situation? Well, you know, as, as you know, um, Chairwoman, uh, uh, we have an absolute firm opposition to uh, the Palestinians bypassing negotiations, uh, attempting to achieve recognition and. Uh, you know, quasi-statehood by going to the United Nations and any UN uh, agency. Uh, and we've made it clear that it's not only the administration's position, but that under uh, existing law, uh, there is a prohibition on uh, our being able to fund any organization that goes ahead and gives uh, uh, that kind of recognition. And so what we have tried to do is make our views known and make it, uh, uh, frankly, uh, a, a part of the uh, calculation that goes on in these organizations that they're going to um, suffer from, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, withdrawal of funding. 
having said that, and I, I think I've talked with you and, and perhaps Mrs. Lowy and, and others about this, um, we have uh, concerns about uh, what might happen if the international community were to start recognizing uh, and granting membership to uh, the Palestinians despite our best efforts. Uh, we have a veto, so we can, permit, we can prevent membership in the UN, but we can get outvoted in all these other organizations. Um, and if, for example, the World Health Organization were to do that, or the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, were to do that, um, we would uh, think that was not in the best interest of the United States to sort of lose our leverage and our influence. Um, so it's a complicated issue for us. And, um, the, and you know, I, w I would, would welcome uh, the, the tightest possible uh, written uh, waiver uh, because, you know, right now we're in this anomalous situation. Um, Israel remains a member of UNESCO. Um, and so they believe, as we do, that UNESCO actually does things that are very much in Israel's interest. Holocaust education is a, a clear example. So we just want to try to have s some flexibility in the event that there is a serious uh, issue that needs American leadership and uh, participation. I understand. 